Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Jill Robbins reports on the rise of Rohingya refugees who have died at sea. Dan Friedel has a story on the concrete used by ancient Romans. Mario Ritter Jr. brings us the technology report about a large home built by a 3D printer. Later, we present the next part in our American history series, "The Making of a Nation." But first, here is Jill Robbins. The United Nations Refugee Agency has reported a big rise in the number of Rohingya refugees who died at sea in 2022. The UN Refugee Agency (UNHCR) said at least 348 people died or disappeared while trying to flee Myanmar or Bangladesh by boat. The agency said more than 3,500 Rohingya tried sea crossings in the Bay of Bengal, or the Andaman Sea, last year. That is five times more than the year before. UNHCR spokeswoman Shabia Mantu said the big increase suggests there is despair among the population of refugees. Mantu said. We are hearing reports from Rohingya about this growing sense of desperation and anxiety about the future. She added that many are being exploited by human traffickers who give false promises and false hope. She said most of the thirty-nine boats making the sea crossings last year left Myanmar and Bangladesh. In the last two months of 2022. The UNHCR said 450 Rohingya arrived in Aceh, Indonesia. Another boat carrying 100 people disembarked in Sri Lanka. A boat carrying 180 Rohingya Muslims is feared to have sunk in December. The UNHCR said it had called on maritime officials in the area to rescue people at sea. But those requests had been ignored, and boats have been at sea for weeks. In August 2017, more than 750,000 Rohingya Muslims, who faced violence and persecution in Myanmar, fled to Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh. They have been living in overcrowded camps with other refugees since then. The UNHCR says conditions in Myanmar. Have not improved, and it remains unsafe for the Rohingya to return. The group is barred from receiving citizenship. I'm Jill Robbins. Researchers have wanted to know for years why the buildings made by the ancient Romans held up so well. A new study finds that their concrete, a strong building material. Had special characteristics. Researchers say the materials in the concrete worked together to make it stronger. The three main parts were lime, volcanic ash, and water. Lime is a powdery substance that comes from heating limestone. Admir Mashich is a civil and environmental engineering professor. At Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, who led the study and published the results in Science Advances, he said the way the Romans started using lime over two thousand years ago gave the concrete self-healing properties. He said the discovery will help current builders. Improve their concrete through a Roman-inspired strategy. 
Mashich is working to make a new building product based on the Roman concrete and is hoping to sell it through a new business he started. Mashich and his researchers wanted to know why the Roman structures lasted so long when even some modern concrete crumbles after only a few years. In addition, the Roman concrete was good for use underwater. This quality helped the Romans build harbors and other structures that could hold back the ocean. The researchers said some small bits of lime that were not well mixed into the concrete were not a mistake, as was thought earlier. The pieces of lime are called clasts. The new study called the clasts instrumental. Mashich said, the small pieces of lime keep the concrete from falling apart when it cracks. In most cases, a crack in concrete permits water to enter and the crack widens. But in the Roman concrete, the small bits of lime would dissolve and send small pieces of calcium into the cracks. That action, Mashich said, repaired the cracks. In addition, he noted, the calcium mixed with the volcanic ash to create a stronger structure. Both the Pantheon and the Colosseum are examples of buildings that are almost 2,000 years old that used the ancient concrete and are still standing today. In the past, researchers thought the important material was volcanic ash that came from the area of Pozzuoli near Naples. Linda Seymour helped write the study when she was studying at MIT. She called the ancient Romans great engineers. She added, The fact that we can still walk around many of their structures is a testament to that. I'm Dan Friedel. A huge 3D printer is working to create what is believed to be the first two-story home built with the technology in the United States. The home is currently taking shape in Houston, Texas. The 3D printing machine working on the project weighs more than 12 tons. The 3D printer is using concrete to produce the home, which will be about 371 square meters. Some parts of the home will also have wood elements. Leaders of the project said the process is expected to take about 330 hours of printing. Leslie Locke is the architect who designed the three-bedroom home and who leads the design studio, Hannah. Locke told Reuters news agency that in the design process, the team had to think about more than the design of the house and how it would be used. We also design the actual print path, like how the printer will print, where it starts and where it stops, Locke said. The project is a two-year cooperative effort by Hannah building company Perry 3D, and Civ, which provided engineering support. Locke said, since the printer does most of the work, fewer workers are needed at the building site. She said the effort only requires four to five people to oversee the 3D printing process. Locke said, one of the benefits is also it takes a lot of the heavy lifting, the labor, from human workers. Concrete is a very strong material to use in home building, 
and can survive hurricanes, heavy storms, and other severe weather. Roberto Montemayor is the project leader for Perry 3D construction. He told Reuters the large 3D printer operates in much the same way as the small printers used in homes and offices. But there are two main differences. The first is that the home-building 3D printer can be expanded and changed to fit the needs of any sized project, Montemayor said. The other difference is the material it uses. We are printing here with concrete, which is a completely different material than plastic. The home is expected to be completed in the second half of 2023. The builders say they hope the modern method can be used in the future to build even larger housing structures. They said the technology can also build homes faster and for a lot less money. A growing number of American companies have begun offering homes built with 3D printing technology in recent years but so far the homes being offered are much smaller. The startup company Icon, based in Austin, Texas, made news in 2018 by completing the first permitted 3D printed home in the U.S. At the time, it said, the home had been built in just one day. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. You just heard Mario Ritter, Jr. present this week's technology report. Welcome, Mario. Thanks, Dan. The story is about a house being printed using a huge machine. How do you print a house? Good question, Dan. Many of our listeners have printers at home. They print documents from computers. This story is about a machine that builds a house using similar technology. Instead of printing ink onto paper, the machine sets layers of concrete, one on top of the other. So it's a printer in three dimensions, or 3D. In the story, you used the sentence, the home is currently taking shape in Houston, Texas. Can you explain what taking shape means? Sure, Dan. Taking shape is an idiomatic way of saying that something is beginning to come together to appear in its finished form, whether it was meant to look that way or not. Since the story is about a house, we could also have said built. Taking shape is a less exact way of saying it, but some people might think it's interesting. It is interesting. Thanks for coming on the show, Mario. Thanks, Dan. It's great to be on your show. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. In the spring of 1865, the American Civil War was over. And the president who had led the Union during that war was dead. Abraham Lincoln had been murdered before the final surrender of Confederate forces. Now, the reunited nation had a new president, Andrew Johnson. He had been Lincoln's vice president. The Chief Justice of the United States swore Johnson into office a few hours after Lincoln's death. Most of Lincoln's cabinet was there, together with leading members of Congress. They looked to the new president with a mixture of shock and hope. Shep O'Neill and Tony Riggs begin the story of America's 17th president. Andrew Johnson was, like Abraham Lincoln, a man of the people. 
He was born in North Carolina. His family was poor. There was no money or time for young Andrew to go to school. When he was fourteen years old, his mother sent him to work for a tailor to learn to make clothes. Andrew worked hard. He opened his own tailoring business in the eastern part of the state of Tennessee. When he was eighteen, he married. His wife, Eliza, taught him to read and write. Andrew became active in politics. At the age of twenty-one, he was elected to the town council. Two years later, he became mayor of the town. At thirty-five, he won a seat in Congress in Washington. Next, he became governor of Tennessee. Then the state made him one of its two senators. The poor tailor boy was a success. Andrew Johnson was a member of the Democratic Party. In the presidential election of 1860, he supported his party's candidate, not the candidate of the Republican Party, Abraham Lincoln. But Lincoln won the election, and, as a result, southern states carried out their earlier threat. They began leaving the Union to form their own nation. Johnson opposed this secession. He believed the South should remain part of the United States. He decided he had no choice but to support the Republican president. Most of the other citizens in Tennessee disagreed with him. They decided to leave the Union. Andrew Johnson had to flee his home to save his life. He returned only after Union forces took control of Tennessee and made him military governor. President Lincoln noticed the man from Tennessee who supported the Union over the opposition of others. In 1864, Lincoln decided to run for re-election. He chose Johnson to be his vice presidential candidate. Lincoln hoped Johnson would win the support of Union-loving Democrats. He hoped Johnson would help heal the wounds between North and South. Now Lincoln was dead, and Johnson was president. It was up to this little-known former tailor to make the decisions on reconstruction, on rebuilding the Union. Johnson, not Lincoln, would decide if Reconstruction would be easy or hard. Johnson would choose if the North would punish the defeated rebel states or be merciful to them. The radicals of Lincoln's Republican Party wanted severe Reconstruction. They said the South was a defeated enemy. They demanded strong punishment for all Southerners who took part in the rebellion. These radicals had disliked Lincoln's plans for Reconstruction. They felt he was too weak. Now they hoped Johnson would share their ideas. They urged him to call a special session of Congress to pass strong legislation against the South. The radicals had reason to believe the new president agreed with them. He had called the rebels traitors. He had demanded strong action against them when the war ended. The time has come, Johnson had said, when the American people should understand what crime is and that it should be punished. 
But Andrew Johnson surprised the radicals. He did not call the special session of Congress. Instead, he announced his own program for the southern states. Johnson declared a pardon for all former Confederates who promised to support the Union and obey laws against slavery. Then he permitted former officials of the Confederacy to run for office in their state's new elections. Many of these former rebels were elected. The radical Republicans were angry. They saw these elections as proof that the South had not really changed. They accused Johnson of being too soft. They urged him to punish the rebels. One radical newspaper wrote, There is only one sure and safe policy for the immediate future. The North must remain the dictator of the Republic until the spirit of the North shall become the spirit of the whole country. The South's treason is still unpunished. Southerners cannot be trusted. The radicals also worried about what would happen to the recently freed slaves. They said the new state governments of the South would not treat blacks as free and equal citizens. As proof, they pointed to new laws the Southern legislatures passed. For example, the state legislature in Mississippi said no black person could rent farmland. It said a black person needed special permission to work at any job except farming. Mississippi also passed a law saying a black person could be forced to work for a white man, usually his former owner, if he had no other job. Another way the state governments in the South acted against blacks was by refusing to give them the right to vote. The radical Republicans decided that President Johnson's Reconstruction program must be stopped. They began working to get control of Congress, to pass their own program. Only by gaining political power could they punish the South and guarantee full political rights to former slaves. The radicals tried to take control in two ways. First, they refused to let many of the recently elected Southern congressmen take their seats when Congress opened. Then they formed their own Joint Committee on Reconstruction. This committee not the Senate or the House of Representatives, would make many of the decisions about Reconstruction. Radical lawmakers took other steps to seize control of Reconstruction efforts in the South. Congress had established a government agency to take care of black refugees in the South. The agency gave food and clothing to former slaves who had no food, money, or jobs. It began to teach them to read and write. Republicans in Congress moved to extend the life of the agency and increase its powers. They passed a bill and sent it to the White House for the President's approval. President Johnson vetoed the bill. He said it would create false hopes among former slaves. He also said it was unconstitutional. The radicals tried to overturn Johnson's veto. However, they failed to get the necessary votes. 
Congress passed several other bills giving the federal government power to protect the rights of blacks in the southern states. President Johnson vetoed these bills, too. He said they interfered with the rights of the states. These defeats made the radicals even more angry. Their newspapers began a steady attack against the president and his policy toward the South. Some even accused him of treason. Many Americans agreed with this criticism of President Johnson. They gave the radicals a big victory in congressional elections of 1866. Radical leaders gained the power to pass any bill they wished, even over the president's veto. And they wasted no time doing just that. Time after time, they voted to overturn Andrew Johnson's vetoes. The atmosphere in Washington became very tense. Relations between Congress and the White House sank to their lowest level in history. The political skies darkened. Soon, the storm broke. The radicals tried something that had never been tried before. They tried to remove the president from office. The conflict between the radicals and Andrew Johnson would provide some of the most historic and intense moments in American history. That will be our story in the next program of The Making of a Nation. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 